This program is dedicated to those that paid for their lives at the hands of the state. Hello and welcome to another edition of Silent Voices, the only program in America that you, the viewer, can have your voice heard regarding the child welfare system. I am Dennis Lawrence and beside me is the Maria Malin. Thank you and welcome to our December 2015 program. Dennis, we have had such an outpouring from people around the nation lately. It seems the family court system is expanding and including new families every single day. We have numerous letters every month here at Silent Voices. And Dennis, I know you have one you'd like to share with our viewing audience. Well, here at Silent Voices, we receive emails all the time. And I had to pull this one out. It was uh, so heart-wrenching. Um, this here is a picture of uh, Dana and her children. And this is what the email reads. Last year, my best friend's boyfriend hurt her two-year-old daughter. My friend did exactly as she should and called the police. Kicked him out, and DHS came and took all five of her children, ages seven to six months at the time. My friend fought hard. She took parenting classes, counseling, paid the state child support for each one of the children. Got a bigger house, a four bedroom, as opposed to the three bedroom she had. So the kids would have had more space. She made all her court dates and all her visits. She passed random drug screens and home inspections. Yet her rights were terminated in October for all of her children. There was nothing she could do. And yesterday, and this is speaking in um, November, uh, right before Thanksgiving, she took her life. And as far as I'm concerned, DHS pulled the trigger for her. And that's uh, from one of the Rebus family's uh, friends. So, Maria? You know, Dennis, this is such a sad story, and it really does hit home for me. I lost my precious son um, f to suicide. Um, we'll have to try to get one of the family members after they're done grieving to come on our show and share their story. We have been losing so many parents and children from suicide because they're being ripped apart. It's just... It's a tragedy all the way around, and we're losing some incredible people um, on this earth that should be here. You know, it's really amazing at the news articles that pop up every month concerning the child welfare system, and daily, in fact. This month and every month after, we are going to do include a news segment of the previous month. Here is just a sampling of some of the news articles coming across our newsroom desk. December 2015, NPR News. And here's our own news anchor, Wendy Jenkins. Here's a look at the headlines for December 2015. U.S. Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia told a law school audience on Monday that there is no U.S. constitutional right of parents to direct the education and upbringing of their children. The nation's charter document is not a perfect constitution and many important rights are not contained there, Scalia told an auditorium 
of first-year law students at Georgetown University Law Center. For example, my right to raise my children the way I want, he said, to teach them what I want them taught, not what Big Brother says, that is not there. To a large degree, Scalia was repeating views he has long held and expressed in dissents in the High Court's decades-old precedents that say that parents do have such a fundamental right to direct the upbringing of their children. In Troxell versus Granville, in a 2000 case about grandparents' child visitation rights, the court reaffirmed that view. More than a year after a Bath father was accused of abusing his infant son, he and his wife have regained custody of their children after claiming he was wrongfully accused. In April 2014, a trip to the doctor led to Brandon Ross facing 12 serious charges of child abuse for fractures found in his then two-month-old son, Ryder Ross. Since then, doctors in Boston, Ohio, and Illinois have diagnosed Ryder with a genetic metabolic bone disease, most likely Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. In May, while, leaving in, while living in foster care, a follow-up x-ray revealed that at least one new fracture, there was at least one new fracture in Ryder Ross's wrist. Every expert that I talked to after that point said this is a closed case. If he had another fracture outside of your care, that's a telltale sign that there is something else going on here, Cynthia Ross said. The state of Maine refused to accept the results, which would have meant a lengthy wait for the case to play out in court. In September, Brandon Ross took a plea deal. He pleaded no contest to two misdemeanor charges and the case was closed. A foster mother is facing jail after she admitted killing a 23-month-old baby boy who died in her care. Harry Aspley was rushed to, hospital, rushed to a hospital after becoming unwell at his home, but died five days later. His foster mom, Wendy Hardy, 46, pleaded guilty to manslaughter after initially denying the charge. Children sleeping in Arkansas Department of Health Service offices, um, because of foster care challenges, have anywhere from 20 to 40 kids that they have to find placement for. They had to overload foster homes in order to have beds for their children so they didn't sleep in offices at night. It meant caseworkers were working up to 60 hours a week and were overworked. Two, teen two teenage sisters found safe in Minnesota after disappearing two years ago may have been kept in hiding by an advocacy group critical of family courts that award custody to abusive parents. Samantha Rucky, 17, and her sister Gianna, 16, were found in good health at a horse farm in Grants County in west central Minnesota. In Georgia, when the Noah's Ark Children's Care Home opened its doors in the early 1990s, it did so as a residential group home with the mission of providing a nurturing environment for state confiscated children, according to IRS filings. An investigation found evidence the group home closed in 2010 but continued to solicit donations from the public, accepting at least $658,000 in contributions from donors in the years that followed. In Kansas, the state agency tasked with investigating child abuse plans to lower the amount of evidence needed to substantiate a claim of abuse or neglect. Department for Children and Families Secretary Phyllis Gilmore told lawmakers Tuesday the agency will decrease the standard of evidence it uses when investigating from clear and convincing to preponderance of the evidence. In effect, the change will mean that only 51% of the evidence needs to point to abuse or neglect actually taking place in order to claim to be substantiated. Four months after the governor declared a crisis in the Arkansas foster system, a panel of lawmakers learned Wednesday that little progress is being made on some of the major problems. Workers work 60 hours per week and are responsible for 45 children in the state's foster care system. Those stresses were part of the reason that back in July, Governor Asa Hutchinson pledged $8 million to hire 200 new caseworkers over three years. Our objective is to reduce the caseload for those workers in the field, he said on July 16th. 
but since then, DHS has only increased its number of caseworkers by 15. They are hiring new caseworkers, but turnover is high. 50% of current workers were hired within the last year. Starting pay is just $30,000 a year. A Kansas politician and his wife, who were previously awarded for their efforts as adoptive, adoptive parents, were arrested and charged for abusing five of the 16 children in their care, officials said. Jonathan Robert Schum, 34, a Topeka City Councilman, and his wife Allison Nicole Schum, 32, were arrested last Thursday and charged with one count each of aggravated battery, according to reports. The abuse allegedly took place between October 7th and 11th and involved children between the ages of 5 and 16. The couple were also charged with four counts of endangering a child, which reportedly took place on October 31st. Court documents reportedly said that a 12-year-old was tortured and cruelly beaten by the Shums, who have four biological children and ten adoptive children who were brought into the home between 2006 and 2013. They were also reportedly fostering two children when they were arrested. The Shums, who were reportedly homeschooling the children, were awarded in 2013 an Angels in Adoption Award, which honors individuals who help children in need of homes. A Connecticut foster mother with the State Department of Children and Families has been arraigned on charges she assaulted an infant placed in her care. 23-year-old Danielle Clark of East Windsor was charged Sunday with second-degree assault and risk of injury to a child. Authorities say the child had a swollen and blackening eye, bruises on his right arm, and other injuries. X-rays revealed he had two fractured femurs. Representatives from the Georgia Department of Community Health recently testified in front of a House Study Committee on Children's Mental Health. They showed the state spent more than $22 million on psychotropic drugs in fiscal year 2015. A report from the Government Accountability Office found as many as 39% of foster kids receive psychotropic drugs. That's 11 times higher than non-foster children. As a newly hired employee for a Miami Social Services Agency, Leslie Rubero Padilla's job was to reunite unaccompanied refugee children with their parents or legal guardians in the United States. She was supposed to charge the families only for transportation such as airfare, but authorities say Ribeiro shook down more than a dozen of them by insisting they had to send her additional money or the reunification with their children would be delayed or worse, they would be deported back to their native country in Central America. Spanking one's child does not amount to abuse that warrants judicial intervention, at least as long as the child is not seriously injured or endangered, a state appeals court has ruled. California law authorizes reasonable methods of parental discipline, which can include reasonable and age-appropriate spanking to the buttocks, the Second District Court of Appeal in Los Angeles said Tuesday. Fifty years after a St. Louis gospel singer said she was told that her daughter died at birth, a claim disputed by authorities, and months after the 76-year-old woman learned that her daughter was still alive, a judge is being asked to restore the birth mother's parental rights. Attorney Albert Watkins announced the petition Tuesday in St. Louis Circuit Court in which the daughter, Melanie Diane Gilmore, seeks to invalidate her 1983 adoption and reestablish Zella Jackson Price as her legal mother. Price said a nurse told her that her daughter had died shortly after, but that she was not allowed to see the deceased infant and never received a death certificate. A homeschooling couple has agreed to accept a settlement offer from a Missouri sheriff and his deputy after they filled a lawsuit for being pepper sprayed and tasered for for refusing to let police in their house without a warrant. The situation occurred in September 2011 after Missouri Child Protective Services agent had visited the home of Jason and Laura Hagen of New Hampton following a complaint of a messy home. When a caseworker sought to return a second time for a follow-up, the couple refused. CPS then called the police. 
21-year-old Sydney White was sentenced on Monday to 30 years, plus a consecutive one-year sentence for tampering with evidence in the death of 11-month-old Angel Place. White pleaded guilty in August to child abuse, resulting in death and tampering with physical evidence. Social workers removed Angel from her biological parents and placed her with White and her husband and their two children in July of 2014. Grand Junction police say White told them she violently shook Angel, grabbing the child with both hands by the neck September 15th when the infant wouldn't stop crying. A mother facing up to six months behind bars for letting her four-year-old son play alone in a playground 120 feet away from her front door. Sonia Hedren, who described herself as a free-range parent, found herself in hot water with Child Protective Services after letting her son play alone in the playground of their gated apartment complex in Sacramento. Oklahoma subjected children to abuse in a former foster home in a trailer with 10 monkeys, just part of a menagerie that included 11 lemurs, marmosets, cotamundis, raccoons, don donkeys, and other animals, guardians claim in court. Lead plaintiff Rachel Matthews sued the Oklahoma Department of Human Resources, several of its Delaware County employees, and parents Deidre and Jerry Matthews of Jay on Tuesday in federal court. In Hartford, Vermont, a bomb threat directed at the office of the State Department for Children and Families in White River Junction was the first in a series of calls state and local police responded to on Friday morning. While officers were investigating the bomb threat at Windsor Superior Court, where the DCF office is located, investigators learned that several suspicious packages had been delivered throughout the town by U.S. mail. One of the packages went to the courthouse and was discovered at the same time police were investigating the 9.45 a.m. threat. A pediatric nurse and foster parent who filmed himself molesting two babies in his care in San Diego was sentenced to 80 years in federal prison Monday, but all but guaranteeing that he spends the rest of his life behind bars. State child welfare officials removed two-year-old Layla Marie Daniel from her home because of safety concerns, placing her with a family friend. But instead of keeping the toddler safe, that person killed the child weeks ago, starving and beating her with such force as to split her pancreas. Police arrested Jennifer Rosenbaum, 27, and charged her with murder, aggravated assault, and child cruelty. Also arrested was her husband, Joseph Rosenbaum, 26, charged with child cruelty. Child Protective Services accused the GWAS of medical neglect even though doctors could not explain why their toddler aged son was not thriving like his twin sister. CPS has admitted in open court that they have not one shred of evidence that the child was neglected, the children were abused, the children were abandoned or mistreated. Just for talking to Fox 26, social media posts, and starting a GoFundMe account in their son's name, the judge has ordered the couple to pay $5,000 in sanctions. The Boston Globe is reporting the state agency fired 10 employees for failing to get social work licenses required by a new state law. The workers can apply next month for lower level positions. The Michigan Judicial Tenure Commission has issued a two-count complaint against embattled Oakland County Circuit Court Judge Lisa Ogorsica, who last summer ordered three minor children at the center of a bitter custody, child custody case handcuffed and sent to a detention center for refusing to have lunch with their estranged father. And that's the news for December 2015. It's just amazing what is going on in this corrupt system. We've been broadcasting now for five years. There was a time when we had a small feature called the Wall of Shame. Well, here we're bringing back by popular demand the Michigan for Parental Rights Wall of Shame.
A Michigan judge who ordered some siblings to juvenile detention for refusing to meet with their estranged father is now facing backlash. A formal complaint has been filed by the Michigan Judicial Tenure Commission against Judge Lisa Gorsica. The commission has also requested that the Supreme Court appoint a master to preside over a formal hearing in the matter. Gorsica's case involving the three Simani kids made international news this summer. Judge Gorsica sent them to Children's Village as punishment for refusing to have lunch with their father. Those siblings are now 14, 11, and 10 years old. There was such an outcry they were allowed out of the Children's Village and moved to an extensive family treatment. The case is still winding its way through the courts with numerous calls to efforts to have Judge Gorsica removed from the case. So far, all of those have been unsuccessful. Now this formal complaint alleges that Judge Garcica failed to act in a patient, dignified, courteous manner, that she displayed improper demeanor, that she had used a raised, angry voice, and she laughed at the children and was sarcastic with them, and that she was misrepresented the law. All of this is found to be true could constitute misconduct in office, according to the complaint filed by the Michigan Judicial Tenure Commission. Judge Garcica, you're on the Michigan for parental rights wall of shame. Oh, I would hate to ever have my picture on that wall of shame. Well, something we are going to do every month is a feature of a child or children that have been taken. Here is this month's Taken. This, my friends, is baby Mia. She has breastfeeding newborn taken 36 hours after birth. Her parents, Thomas and Selena Legault, were thrown out of the hospital by five security guards. Hospital workers called the hotline and reported Mia tested positive for marijuana. Michigan CPS kidnapped baby Mia based on lies. 24 hours later at the emergency hearing, CPS admitted both mother and baby tested negative, yet CPS still has not returned baby Mia. You can find more Taken photos on Facebook. Just search the word Taken at the top of the page. Now, a word from Legally Kidnapped. Who is it? I'm from Child Protective Services. <laughs> We will be back after these messages. We have breaking news on the Rocky sisters. The Rocky girls were sent to teen prison to be tortured in a submission. The mom is accused of alienating and remains jailed on, $1 million, on a $1 million bond while the accused father, child rapist, was let out on a $100,000 bond Thursday. Uppity women are apparently more dangerous than child rapists. The irony, the court violates the mother's right to keep and protect her children, which causes her and her girls to have to escape into hiding. And then the protective mother is charged with felonies for violating the abusive father's rights. The judge told me Kids have no choice, and I have no choice, Gianna said about judge denying the wish to live with her mother. Teens Samantha and Gianna, 17 and 16, were sent by a new judge, Meyer, mayor, outside of state, because only a few states allow the type of kid torture necessary to force compliance. They were sent to an undisclosed lockdown facility where prisoner of war methods will be used to break the girl's will to be free from their father, who they say is abusive and has threatened to kill their mother and them. The judge and mainstream media are calling their treatment at the facility a reunification program, 
but that is a euphemism used to deceive the public into thinking it is good is it a good thing when in fact the methods used are unethical and extremely harmful psychologically and often physically as well many teens have become emotionally disturbed and some have even died in those types of programs where there is little regulation or oversight Sam and Gianna were caught two weeks ago at a Minnesota horse farm for abused kids where they had been in hiding from their reportedly abusive father for over two years. They have been in foster care since their capture and social services is recommending they stay there presumably because of the serious abuse, domestic violence and threats to kill they have reported over the years by their father. But Judge Michael Mayer overruled both social services recommendations and the nearly adult girl's request to live in foster care rather than with their father. Judge Mayer completely disregarded the reported abuse and the girl's wish to live with their mother and has sent them to a lockdown facility where they will attempt to break them of their will to be free of their father. The way Judge Mayer is justifying being able to disregard a 17 and 16 year old's wishes is by f making false, unsupported findings against their mother. She is accused of brainwashing, alienating the children into not wanting to live with their father. There is no credible evidence to support these accusations and there is abundant evidence of the father's abuse. If you would like to be a guest on Silent Voices, contact us at miparentalrights at gmail.com. That's miparentalrights at gmail.com. I want to thank you, the viewers, for watching this week. You can catch us next week, same time, same channel. Until next week, my friends, remember, your, your voice can make, make a difference. difference.